my role has been to write the book mm -hmm. and to you know tell the story, which is an incredible story. Help Preston tell the story in writing, which mm -hmm. is a, and uh, Duncan's story as well, which is a very incredible story. Now there's also the role of verifying what they say, as is humanly possible, and in addition to that, finding out you know what other strange you know what is an objective look at the story mm -hmm. and a lot of the information is not easy to objectivize for the simple reason that some much of it comes from uh, witnesses that Preston has interviewed for a period of over you know something like 10 years or something like that and strange experiences and mm -hmm. he's not perhaps chronicled them as you know it's that he's not a journalist he's mm -hmm. an investigator and a you know paranormal engineer. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what some of the interesting things are that are an objective look is that uh, there's been at least three eyewitness accounts of stealth airplanes hovering over the Montauk base. Mm -hmm. Actually hovering without making any noise. Mm -hmm. A hovercraft would make a substantial amount of noise. Uh, this would appear to be some sort of anti-gravity. Specifically a stealth? Stealth airplanes. The size of the B-bomber or does it have any connection to the boomerang style? I don't know enough about the different types of stealth yeah. But it would be a, definitely, from what I've been told, a stealth airplane. One mm -hmm. of these was a local, uh, one of them was a friend of mine who happens to be a clairvoyant, Maria Fix. Other lady, uh, and she was with another person uh, who saw this. Mm -hmm. The uh, Another townsperson, Carol Brady, uh, out there, she's a real estate agent in, in Montauk. She saw a stealth airplane um, and was not surprised uh, at all. She also uh, has three boys who are blue-eyed and blonde hair and she was very well aware that they were kidnapping people who were blue-eyed and blonde hair as late as I think 88 mm -hmm. and uh, the, she said the police were involved they knew about this and uh, so this is a another substantiation of Preston's story from a totally independent source. There's also uh, Preston after the book was written he proceeded to introduced me to different people who have had various involvements in one way or another. One of the more interesting was a, a man who had uh, worked as a contractor in the underground at Montauk in the 70s. Mm -hmm. He went down there and serviced the Amplitrons. He saw, I think, 20 or tw 24 Amplitrons underground, mm -hmm. and he serviced them. He's a, a nuclear physicist, and he said there's no reason on Earth you would want Amplitrons down there to amplify uh, sage radar signals or transmissions, there's no reason for it mm -hmm. uh, unless they're doing something awfully strange or unusual. So, so that's a, a very interesting piece of information. Also his, his assistant said that he had seen an antenna that had been serviced. This was in, I think, 1990 or thereabouts. An uh, antenna in the transmitter building that was actually clean and serviced with a tag. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the, the woman, the real estate agent told me that she'd seen, she said they were using that SAGE radar uh, out there and because she, she would see the uh, big reflector moving. Mm -hmm. Now Preston said there's no way that reflector could move. On further investigation, uh, this physicist's assistant said that this, there is a hand crank and it was recently greased mm -hmm. so that you can actually because uh, the the yeah the motor is dead to the reflector, oh, but you can actually manually. hand mm -hmm. manually hand crank this radar reflector. So she she was uh, quite satisfied that that thing had been being used. Mm -hmm. Now well, the motors are actually missing. Oh yeah, the crank that oh. ran the reflector. Right, and there's there's all other stories. Uh, one of the the local historian out there had told me of an uh, instance of him going to the base and seeing. Uh, he, and this is in '72. He mm -hmm. brought a friend of his back from lunch to the base where it was heavily patrolled with uh, people with, you know, soldiers with guns and one of the soldiers put a gun as they drove up to the inner gate right on his three-year-old son. Mm -hmm. He told him to remove it from his son and then he pointed it right at at him. Mm -hmm. This is a, you know, highly irregular behavior for a, what was considered in a federal aviation or at the FAA radar facility. Mm -hmm. So, so there are many stories that would definitely corroborate that there was a secret mm -hmm. uh, project of a highly secure nature and highly debatable nature as, as to whether it had any validity. And perhaps uh, we had shown you some pictures earlier of the uh, uh, programming room on the base. Now the mm -hmm. programming room, uh, what this was, is we just recently uh, discovered this. This is a room with uh, 
One is a psychedelic room with graffiti looking stuff that's painted in a pattern by an artist. Mm -hmm. Another one is a black and white room. Another one is a paisley room. And then there's a leopard striped room, which uh, reminds, reminds us of the Timothy Leary experiments in the 60s. This could have been going on in the 60s. Um, so this is like uh, very hard evidence that something of an irregular nature was going on at the base. Mm -hmm. And as I'm saying, uh, we've also had uh, Helga Morrow contact us. Helga is a, is a woman whose father was involved in the Philadelphia and Montauk projects. Helga, uh, her father, his name was Frederick Cuppers. She has uh, evidence that her father did not die in, I think it was 62, like uh, mm -hmm. was believed, because the hair on his hands was inconsistent with the man's in the coffins. And um, she was surrounded by trench-coated men at the time as well. So she, she uh, came here and visited us, and there was a lot of interesting collaboration with her mm -hmm. and uh, Preston and Duncan. But, uh, and she can go on ad infinitum about this. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, my main, basically what I have to say is there's, there's a lot to what's backing up their story. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we can prove the time is, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. But that will come hopefully in time. It's just like, so that's basically why I'm here is to add some credibility to what they're saying. Not mm -hmm. to swallow their story, but to, uh, there's something here that warrants investigation and mm -hmm. further investigation and that's what my role is in, uh, as I say, writing the first book, we're working on a second book and also mm -hmm. publishing a newsletter to further inform people on what we are finding. And I think we're going to be um, very, very we're going to have a lot more stuff coming, I can guarantee mm -hmm. you that. Essentially, what they would do is they would go out into the public. They first look for street wives. They were interested mainly in blonde, blue-eyed boys. They centered on the ages of maybe 10 to 16, 17. Although, as Duncan pointed out, they went a lot younger, a lot older. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing with these boys, outside the research end of it, was they had multiple, multiple parts of the, <clears throat> of the project. They would take these boys and they would essentially indoctrinate them, mm -hmm. and they would whip them to within an inch of their life. Mm -hmm. you know, bestiality, brutality. The idea was they wanted to break the mind. When the mind was broken at that extreme point of fear, there were two things they were interested in. There had to be an alien connection into this because there's reports of some sort of technological device that would gather the patterns of fear. Hmm. There's also reports that there were some hormones removed from the bodies hmm. after the height of fear point. Secondly, they would electromagnetically capture the mind patterns that were released from the body. Mm -hmm. They were stored in a big computer system. Mm -hmm. They would manipulate and redesign the mind, literally redesign it. Then they would use the transmitter and put that mind, that new mind, back into the body through a human psychic adept who like reinstall it through mm -hmm. psychosexual means. Now, the reason they picked Duncan for this is he's blonde, blue-eyed, the whole nine yards of it. Mm -hmm. So they had to pick blonde, blue-eyed people because part of Duncan's mind would become part of the boy's mind. It means mm -hmm. the boy would have a third his original mind, a third of his mind would be computer-oriented, and the other third would be based upon the the personality, consciousness of the transmitter system, Duncan, and anyone else that had an input to it. Mm -hmm. And they would uh, want to pick the mind, so two-thirds of the mind, or, you know, maybe a third to two-thirds of the mind would still be compatible with the body. 